Warning, this is a review of an age-restricted game. If you are not old enough to purchase the game, then please do not watch this video. Thanks to the PlayStation 4 re-release of the original Dead Rising, I've been replaying the entire series over the past few weeks. The initial entry was one of the first Xbox 360 games I ever owned, something I've played through multiple times, and one of very few exclusives I genuinely missed when I later traded my Xbox 360 in for a PlayStation 3. The games certainly aren't for everyone, in fact the original Dead Rising had only sold 1.7 million units as of October 2013, seven years after its 2006 launch. That's not a whole lot in a world where Square Enix considers 3.4 million units sold in just four weeks to be a failure. Is the rest of the world missing out on an underappreciated gem, or am I getting far too much enjoyment out of a flawed game? Join me as we take a look back at Dead Rising to see if it still holds up today. Freelance photojournalist Frank West gets a tip that something strange is going down in the town of Willamette, Colorado. Arriving at the local shopping mall by helicopter, he soon finds himself face to face with hordes of the undead. With his pilot returning in 72 hours, Frank has three days to uncover the truth behind the outbreak, assuming he survives for that long. I'm purposefully not going to comment any further on the story, simply for the fact that Discovery plays a massive part in enjoying both the plot and gameplay here. Dead Rising is a tricky game to get to grips with. Many people find it to be clunky, restrictive, and unintuitive, while others find it to be challenging, respectful of the player's intelligence, and insanely fun to master. Getting the hang of the various systems at play is key to your survival. Your greatest enemy will be the timer. The game runs on a clock. You have time limits for absolutely everything, and there's a lot to get done. You have mainline story quests that start at set times and must be completed before certain deadlines. You'll be asked to meet certain people in particular places at precise times, and you're expected to be there. Failure to meet those requirements means Frank won't find out what's really going on, and the game even has multiple endings to account for this. While this is happening, there'll be a number of side quests that also run on a timer. These will range from saving survivors trapped in the mall to killing psychopaths who have gone insane due to the hell that's been unleashed around them. These are optional, however, getting some of the game's best weapons, shortcuts through the mall, and achievements slash trophies demand that you complete these. A perfect run of completing all story missions, saving all survivors, and killing all psychopaths is possible, just don't expect to do it on your first run through. It requires intimate knowledge of the mall's layout, as well as which events will unfold at what times, so that you can plan efficient routes in advance. To add extra stress, any weapons you find will break after being used only a few times, and you've got limited inventory slots. This means most players are constantly on the back foot, scrambling to grab whatever they can find to keep the mall zombies at bay. You've got a lot of choice, guitars, bowling balls, even katanas and shotguns, just don't expect any of them to last very long. Using up those same inventory slots are food items, pretty much the only way to restore health. Bear in mind that not all food items restore the same amount of health, their effectiveness can change over time, for example raw meat will spoil, and you can also blend or cook food for added bonuses. Did I mention you can only save at either the game's safe house or toilets found within the mall itself? Oh, and the Xbox 360 version only has one save slot. There's a lot of information to take in. The player's expected to make a bunch of decisions at every turn, and when you first boot up the game, you're simply not equipped for it. I can fully respect why many people were turned off by this game within the first hour. It's a bit of a slower burn, it requires a level of commitment to just get to grips with, and although there is a light bulb moment where everything just clicks, it doesn't come soon enough for most. The game is designed for multiple playthroughs, and the strongest piece of evidence for this is its leveling system. Frank starts the game at level 1. He has barely any health, he can't carry many items, and he doesn't know many hand-to-hand -hand combat moves. Killing zombies, taking photos on Frank's camera, completing story missions, saving survivors, and killing psychopaths will net you experience points and allow you to level up. Level increases extend your maximum health, inventory space, and grants you access to special moves. 
When you die, and you will die, you're given the option to start the game over but keep Frank's current level. Even veteran players will struggle to pull off a perfect run playthrough starting from level 1. Further proof of the game's reliance on cycling through it multiple times exists in the title's unlockable items. Beating the game under certain conditions will give you exclusive weapons and costumes. For example, beat the game with any ending after killing 53,594 zombies, and you'll get the real Mega Buster, the game's most powerful projectile weapon, for use in all future playthroughs. By your third reincarnation, you should be more than powerful enough, in terms of both knowledge and equipment, to start having some real fun with the game. Bosses that made you sweat before start to kneel before you. The timer you were always fighting starts to feel much more lenient. You actively plan routes to pick up as many survivors as possible in the shortest amount of time, and there's a fantastic rush that comes with it all, made all the sweeter by the fact that you've really earned this. Once you reach that point, you've still got a surprising amount of replayability. Besides the multiple endings and aiming for a perfect run, beating the game with the best ending unlocks something of an epilogue chapter to play through. Beat that and you'll get Infinite Mode, the ultimate test of your skills where Frank's health constantly depletes due to hunger, you can't save your game at all, and all survivors are hostile. I haven't touched Infinite Mode as beating it requires a 14 hour straight session with permadeath. I have a job, kids. I do not have 14 hours. Infinite Mode's ridiculous requirements aren't the only flaw here. Yes, the game isn't perfect and there are several issues that need to be addressed. I'm sure you've all heard the tales of the dreadful Survivor AI in this game, and I can confirm, they're all true. When you save someone in the mall, you need to escort them back to the safe house. You can escort a maximum of eight people at a time, they all move at different speeds, some need to be carried, they will run into walls, get stuck on objects like trees and benches, and you will be both babysitting and screaming at them. Survivors have their own health bars and they can die. There's nothing more frustrating than having one die five feet from safety because they decided to fight a zombie instead of heading straight for the nearest exit. You can improve their chances by giving them weapons, although not all survivors will accept weapons. If you give them a gun, they'll have infinite ammo, which they'll oftentimes end up shooting you with. You can also give them food to top their health back up, provided you can get them to a safe enough spot where their eating animations won't be interrupted. To accept missions, you'll have to answer calls through a walkie-talkie. While listening to these calls, Frank can't jump or use any weapons. If you receive a call while surrounded by zombies, or worse, during a boss fight, all you can do is run in circles and hope nothing hits you. If the call is interrupted, for any reason, you'll be immediately called back to listen to the whole thing again, only now there's an entire additional text box telling you how rude you are for cutting the last call off, as if you should apologise for focusing your attention on the zombie nibbling on your arm. For a 2006 title, Dead Rising looked pretty good. I'm using the past tense because some of the models certainly haven't held up very well, with human characters feeling like lifeless dolls and noticeably low polygon counts on zombies and objects around them all. The in-game textures for environments and objects are of a low quality, showing compression artifacts and often lacking detail. When the game launched, many people still had standard definition TVs, and the first wave of Xbox 360 consoles didn't even have HDMI ports. The game could run at a maximum resolution of 720p according to Eurogamer, so assets were designed with this in mind. The lower quality textures also helps the game render as many zombies on screen at one time as it does. The textures are far from ugly, the game does a fantastic job of replicating a real mall and shows a great amount of variety, giving each section of the shopping complex its own, instantly recognisable identity. A strong use of themed areas means you'll never mistake the food court for the North Plaza. Dead Rising also packs a surprising amount of humour and references to other Capcom franchises into the game through costumes Frank can wear and items scattered around the mall. I like that the wacky comedy is downplayed, subtle, and doesn't fight for your attention in this entry. The game takes Frank's role as a photojournalist and incorporates that into the user interface. 
Notifications and menus are styled after TV news networks and, despite being a small touch, it's very much appreciated. It almost gives you the feeling Frank is reporting live from the scene of Willamette, and I wish more games would give this much thought to their UI. The original Dead Rising was always going to be a divisive title due mainly to the demands it makes of the player. If you can persevere, you will find an incredibly rewarding and engaging experience that offers a ton of replay value, but that barrier to entry means I simply can't recommend it to everyone. I would at the very least ask that you give it a try, however. Join me again next time when I'll be diving into Dead Rising 2 to see whether the sequel manages to address the problems of the first game while still retaining the series' unique charm. If you'd like to be the first to know when that episode goes live, be sure to click on the subscribe button as well as the little bell next to it. I've been Sam, thank you very much for watching. I'll probably do a couple of takes. Just in case. Is the rest of the world... Is the rest of the world... <laughs> Fuck's sake. The original Dead Rising was always going to be a divisive title, thanks mainly to... <laughs>